Hello everyone and um, thank you for joining us. Welcome to our panel discussion on energy and climate policy running as part of Cork Science Festival and Science Week 2020 which is now in its 25th year. Thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to addressing your questions today. So you can ask questions via the chat function on Teams over on the right hand side or you can do so using Slido with the hashtag climate action for the event where we'll also be running polls. So you can go to slido.com for that or you can download Slido on uh, your phone if you wish to do so. The event is also running as part of a wider virtual climate hack activity for second level students that's led by Mary researcher Conor McGookin. So we would also like to welcome any students joining us from secondary schools in Cork and Kerry and also from any students joining us from UCC's Engineering Society. So we're ready to go. So I'll now pass you over to our chair, Dr. Paul Dean, and his colleagues from MARI's Energy Policy and Modelling Team at UCC's Environmental Research Institute. Over to you, Paul. Thanks very much, Aoife. Good afternoon, everyone. Isn't it a horrible day outside? I know we're all part of the world year in, but it is lashing rain down here in West Cork. So there's no probably better place to be than inside asking good questions and asking really challenging questions. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, uh, as Aoife said, I'm a senior scientist here at the Mari Centre. We're at SFI Centre for Climate, Energy and Marine. And we think a lot about the future. We think a lot about energy. We think a lot about climate action. And we've got three wonderful scientists here today to answer your questions. And a really nice thing about today's event is that it's structured by you. So get involved, ask questions on Slido, uh, ask through your class, ask on the sidebar. Uh, nothing is out of bounds here. Uh, really challenge us and really uh, um, 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 get us to answer those questions as best as we can. And hasn't it been an absolutely wonderful month really in terms of climate action here in Ireland in the House of the Oireachtas, we've got the climate bill going through the uh, uh, through different stages. Um, uh, internationally, we've had pledges for net zero from China, from Japan, even from Russia. And of course, across the water, our neighbours to the to the west or east uh, over in the US, we've had a change of, of, uh, of administration over there. And that's probably really bodes a lot of really positive things for climate action. So today, if you have questions about Ireland, questions about your home, questions about your own life or questions about internationally, please uh, do ask us and do get involved. And if you're on Slido, jump on Slido. We have a little poll because we want to we want to understand what you are thinking about as well. And on Slido, slido.do, uh, jump on to the uh, poll there. And we've got some live polls where you can actually tell us what you think about certain things. So there's a live poll open there at the moment. And what we want to hear uh, from you is, well, what do you think of the current government's 7% reduction target in emissions. Is it good? Is it bad? Not ambitious enough or too ambitious? Uh, let us know what you think and we'll get our panel to discuss that uh, um, later on. Uh, so let's jump to our panel. Um, and the first thing I think we'll do is that we'll just get a sense of what our panel do for a living, what they think about, what kind of keeps them awake at night when they're thinking about climate action. And uh, I let them introduce themselves first of all. So I might go first to my good friend and colleague, Hannah Daly. Hannah, will you tell us a little bit, maybe about two or three minutes about uh, what you do and what your science and what your research is about? And over to you, Hannah. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm a I'm a, also a researcher with the Marai Centre, and I'm also a lecturer of uh, sustainable energy systems in University College Cork. So I, I lecture in the energy engineering department, but also across different disciplinary uh, backgrounds on what is sustainable energy, how can we model it, uh, and and introducing different levels of, uh, of uh, sort of engineers and non-engineers to the concepts of sustainable energy um, and, and and policy. You asked what keeps me up at night. To be frank, Paul, my two year old daughter keeps me up at night. <laughs> But um, but I suppose what what the what 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 really keeps um me me uh, me interested in work right now is the just such a dynamic and interesting time we have for for climate policy. We have so many opportunities, uh, so many people with with huge desire to change um, and 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 um, and make a difference. And policymakers are really getting behind that. So what 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 my research really tries to feed into is is how we can meet climate. Um, change targets at, in the best way to, to, to benefit society the most, to reduce air pollution, reduce energy poverty, um, to create employment, things like that. Um, and, and we're really trying to feed into the Irish Climate Action Plan uh, to achieve that. Um, back to you, Paul. Uh, thanks a million, Hannah. That's great. And, and that's one of the reasons why scientists do drink a lot of coffee. It's, if your research isn't keeping you awake at night, it's your kids. So uh, it's either one or the other. Let me ask Connor. Uh, Connor, you are very involved in research in, in Cork and in Kerry. You've organised this event for Science Week. Tell us, tell us a little bit about your research. Thanks, Paul. 
Uh, thankfully, I don't have children yet. I'm not that old, but I do live on the Gürtel in Vienna at the moment, which is essentially the M50. So I get a lot of ambulances and uh, police keep me up at night. But uh, professionally, I suppose I'm uh, finally a PhD student for our audience members. Uh, so that means next year I have to submit my thesis and then I have to decide what I do next. That's probably what I lose the most sleep over. But yeah, with regards to uh, research and climate policy, my interest is participatory methods in energy system modeling. So looking at stuff like the North South interconnector or the Shan LNG terminal and the tension that was created there locally even and seeing if engineers could do this better. Like how do we go out? How do we ask people what their opinion is of this technology and how do we use that to shape our models? Because at the moment our models generally rely on technology and then economic factors. So it's, you know, what is the cost of the technology or what is the emissions associated with it? It doesn't take into account what people think of the technologies. That is also incredibly hard to quantify. You can't say this technology is liked five out of ten and this one's like six out of ten. So that's kind of oversimplifying what are you know is a very complex response when people have to face these technologies. So you need to figure out a way maybe that it's more an uh, integrated process and it's it's constant, it's ongoing. So we're working down in the Dingo Peninsula a really exciting initiative there, Dingo Peninsula 2030, where we formed a committee with a couple of local representatives and nationally with ESP networks. And we're allowing them then not just, uh, you know, tell us what they think the sort of optimal technology is, but really to build up a relationship and understand what is of interest to the community there and what the challenges is that they face so that the research is, you know, useful to them. Then we're trying to do analysis that can inform the projects down there. And then also that it's, uh, it's not just looking at climate change and energy, I suppose, is one of the big things, but I've come to realize that we can't just tell people, you know, we need to have whatever, twice as much wind as we have now in the future. I'm sorry if you don't like wind turbines, but this is the future. We need to say, well, you know, if we had this much wind, then this is X amount of indigenous jobs. This is, you know, Y amount of fossil fuel that's not imported. So it's good. There's a, there's a broader narrative to capture there. Yeah, back Excellent, Connor. Excellent, Connor. Thanks so much. Thank and coming lastly and not least to uh, to Shane. Shane, you're a postdoc. Will you please explain to us what this mysterious postdoc does and what your research is all about? Um, a, a postdoc is is a great way to. Um, oh, I'm jumping in. A postdoc is a great way to um, push out those big life decisions for another year. So kind of like Connor, um, I was a PhD student recently and I really enjoyed research and so an opportunity came up to continue it but in a full-time position, that is a postdoc. So I started off looking at a novel technology which is something that's called power to gas. So how do we convert electricity into a gaseous fuel for more difficult to decarbonize areas? So everything that can't be electrified, maybe we can electrify it by proxy by turning some of that lovely wind and solar into gas and then using it for heat or for transport for example and that brought me nicely on to my magical postdoc um, where I look at decarbonization of heavy goods vehicles so trucks really it's really difficult to um, make a truck green because you'd have to put about 10 tons of batteries on each truck which isn't very practical so we're looking at things like biofuels and hydrogen and and the fun thing about my postdoc is when I was doing my PhD, it was kind of all desktop based. But now as a postdoc, what I get to do or before Corona came along, what I got to do was to go out and chat to different stakeholders. And so maybe talk to a group that represents truck drivers and see what their opinion is. Talk to a group that um, imports fossil fuels, see how they would be um, best suited to integrating biofuels and bring that all together in policy advice for the government. So. Back to you, Paul. Uh, thanks, Shane. Thanks for that. And maybe just get some. Let's get to some of the questions. Maybe to you first, Connor. Actually, there's a couple of nice questions coming in. And get your questions in on Slidor and the sidebar chatter or chatter. Just email them in directly to us. Connor, there's in a, in a couple of questions. We're going to bundle them together. There's a kind of a sense of frustration with the lack of progress. Things are going very slowly. You know, folks are asking really good questions about. You know, we we've all these technologies like wind turbines and solar panels and EVs. Why are we not doing enough in Ireland and why is the pace of change so slow, Connor? Well, yep, yeah. Uh, yeah, if I could maybe yeah, tell, uh, go back to my work in Dingle, I suppose uh, when I was starting my PhD three years ago, I was, I don't know if naive is the right word, but I was an optimistic uh, young energy engineering graduate 
was very pro climate action and thought anybody that was against climate action was ignorant or arrogant or a fool but have learned that it, there's a lot more to it than that you know it's not just that maybe you don't have the money but maybe you're not actually concerned about climate change because it's not the thing that's most in your face so we go down to a community like dingle it's a rural community and unless these people are able to you know have faith that their community is healthy and they've got a good solid future there it's hard for them to then think about investing in something like a retrofit which is a very large re investment or renewable energy technologies because they've more kind of pressing matters like how do i find a house for my kids in the area or is there even a job for my kid in the area and how am i going to be looked after when i'm older and so it's, it's kind of goes back to that maslow's hierarchy of needs you know to be able to worry about climate change and to actually have the money to invest in a retrofit and a heat pump or an electric vehicle is a bit of a privilege and we sometimes forget that maybe when we say, well, this has to happen, it's mandatory. Yeah, thanks, Connor. Thanks, Connor. Thanks very much. Uh, and maybe Hannah, coming to you next. Hannah, and we've spoken about this to to different climate activists before, and to different uh, to different groups. Uh, and this kind of comes back to one of the questions coming in around this idea that we hear a lot that we've, we've only ten years left to save the planet, and, and the anxiety that that causes. Could you tell us a little bit about that numbers, and maybe what's your reflection on on on, on these more extreme views of the interpretation of climate science? Well, it's, it's unequivocal that we need to um, really reduce our emissions very rapidly to um, on a global level to limit global warming to two degrees or ideally less um, to have a good chance of, of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. That's to limit the worst impacts of climate change. We know that. But this is something like moving a huge super tanker of the world economy around it's the world is very complex, as as Connor said. There's many there's many things, uh, both driving the clean energy transition, but there's also many things stopping it. And it's not necessarily because there's bad people standing in the way. Most emissions, kind of tragically, are what, what makes it most complicated. Is that it's just people living their lives normally. They're driving their kids to school. They're heating their home. They're watching TV. Um, they're they're eating normal food. You know, it's 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 so so the sort of technology and behavior innovation that's needed to to really reduce our emissions. Uh, it, the the scale is is huge, but it but it also there's there's many barriers. So that's one thing. One, um, the Irish government target of reducing emissions by 7% per year, and there's a poll up on Slido about that, comes from um, what we can see is a sort of Ireland's fair share of carbon emissions over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, if you kind of allocate the what's called the global carbon budget, what the whole world can, can emit for, of carbon dioxide and kind of allocate that to Ireland on a, on a per capita basis, we get to about a 7% reduction in CO2 emissions per year. But that really requires a, already a very radical change in our emissions. No other country has reached that target short of economic collapse. You know, Turkey, but Soviet Union in the early 90s uh, reached that level of annual decarbonisation. So, you know, we don't have a dictatorship. We don't have sort of a, a government that, that can just say everybody has to stop driving cars um, or, or everyone has to sit in cold homes. Um, everything has to be done with sort of more gentle carrot and stick. And that takes time uh, and that takes people to pressure politicians into, into doing that as well, because politicians can't, can't make those changes unless there's, there's societal buy-in. Um, I hope that kind of addresses some of the complexity that that, uh, that, that, that achieving these these sorts of things uh, comes with. I know that I, I'm looking at the at the Slido poll and it looks like um, uh, but 43 percent of people so far have said that the 7 percent reduction in emissions target per year is not ambitious enough. This is the most ambitious target of any country in the world and it will be enormously challenging to meet. So if you say that we need to go even further than this, it basically it, it, it goes even further kind of beyond the realms of possibility um, for, for, from what we can envisage at least. Thanks, Hannah. And, in, and and a piece of research that Hannah has done over the year, uh, over the course of the year with uh, uh, with some of her researchers looking at the, the impact of COVID on our emissions in Ireland for 2020. And I think Hannah came up with a figure that our emissions will probably reduce by about 5% this year due to COVID. You know, so you think about our lives and all the stuff that we've all gone through kind of physically and emotionally and all the hardship, you know, and we, we get 5% uh, reduction in emissions. That's uh, it's, it really puts into context what the 7% means, doesn't it? Uh, and this actually comes back, Shane, 
mean, if I come to you next, actually, just a question coming in there from Sean about about transport. Um, um, you know, we hear all about EVs. Uh, why haven't we got more EVs on the road? And why maybe is transport one of the bigger issues facing Ireland in terms of our emissions reductions, Shane? You give them a softball and then you give me this difficult question. I haven't. I'm spending a full year and I haven't got the answer. Um, tra transport is difficult for, for two reasons. Number one, people way underestimate the actual amount of our energy that goes on transport. So 20% of all of the energy we use is electricity and about 40% is transport. So we use twice as much energy in driving our cars and our trucks than we do actually um, in electricity. But all of the success that we tend to see and that's visible is things like wind turbines and solar, and they focus on that, that small 20%. And the solutions in transport tend to be a little more complex and haven't experienced all these um, big cost reductions. So transport, I mean, one of the, the big kind of low hanging fruits would be to convert passenger vehicles to battery electric because number one, um, electric motors are way more efficient. So even just going from a diesel or a petrol engine to an electric motor means you need half the energy. So we're solving the problem. But then we run into issues like um, the electricity grid. So if if we say that twice as much energy is used in transport as electricity, if we try and convert that all to electric vehicles, we've um, essentially trebled the amount of electricity we need. So like um, going back to what Hannah said, it's a really complex problem. And transport is one of those things that's kind of people associate it most with um, kind of freedom. So if you're being told not to drive your car, it has way more of an effect on your life than if you're being asked to maybe switch out your old bulbs for new energy efficient bulbs or when you're in your home, you know, you're switching uh, your appliances for more energy efficient appliances. The same kind of low hanging fruit doesn't exist in transport. You either kind of drive or you don't. Um, and w one thing that's kind of complicated further is is the fight between um, petrol and diesel and the kind of confusion there. So um, diesel is way more CO2, um, how would I say, efficient, but uh, in previous years it had all of the issues of air quality. So outside of le um, electricity and other sectors, transport deals with air quality. We have CO2, we have, you know, a lot of, um, a huge amount of energy to try and change over and I suppose it, it's it's complicated. It would be the short answer, um, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll defer back to Paul now before I time myself in knots. But the the big problem with uh, transport is we underestimate how much energy is used, and everybody does it. Yeah, transport is so tricky, Shane, isn't it? You know, it really is such a large portion of our energy use and emissions. It's our it's our largest sector of emissions um, within the energy sector you know so transport is really really challenging as you said it's wrapped up in personal freedoms and all that maybe coming to you uh, connor next a uh, nice question from alex about and maybe i'll come to each of the panel uh, on, on this as well afterwards on uh, on a personal level what what choices can we make maybe just ask you to think about what one choice or one decision can we make at a personal level that would make the most difference in terms of climate action maybe coming to you first uh, connor and then we'll, we'll go to hannah with that one afterwards yeah, thanks, Paul. And uh, yeah, thanks, Alex. I mean, maybe yeah, I'll just explain what I do personally, I suppose, and how I've leveled it myself. So we all know we should eat less red meat. That was kind of one of the first things that I got into. And But I don't mean you have to be a vegetarian or a vegan. I just don't eat meat on Mondays, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then often not on Fridays either. So it's three days meat, four days not meat. And that still is a big difference than eating meat every day, twice a day. Or just eating chicken as a white meat instead of a red meat can have a big impact on methane emissions. And the other stuff is, as you can probably see, I'm wearing a jumper. So I only put the heating on for an hour and a half in the morning. And then otherwise I wrap up, I put three pairs of socks on and I wear a jumper all day. I try to move a little bit, that can warm me up as well. And that's not ideal for everybody. I know the heating is a tricky one, uh, particularly when I'm at home with my mother. I think um, there's uh, some research into this as well. Mothers see themselves as kind of personally failing if they don't provide a warm home for their children. So they're very much, you know, if they see you put a jumper on there, they say, oh, I should put the heating on. Oh, you're not comfortable, oh dear. Whereas I try to tell my mother, no, no, I'm actually uncomfortable when you put the heating on when I don't want it. So it's yeah, a contradiction perhaps of the, what would happen in most households. And then other things is, yeah, I think someone asked there, why do we focus on eat cars? I mean, this push for electric vehicles is just, you know, keep living in cars, but maybe we should do other things like walk and cycle. As I'm quite fortunate, I live in a city, so that's that's very easy for me. 
as long as it's got good cycling infrastructure, obviously in Ireland, you'd be kind of putting your life in your hands sometimes cycling around Cork and it is built in a valley, so it's not ideal for it. But when you have the option, uh, it's much healthier. I do actually miss walking to the office every day. It's a good little exercise when I now just walk from my kitchen to my living room and then my desk is in the same room. It's not quite the exercise I used to get. Uh, yeah, and then yeah, flying I think is a, is a big one as well, but that's another tricky one. Uh, we've seen at the moment we can live without flying, we can stay at home and we can enjoy Ireland maybe more than we did before. But post COVID, are we really going to want to make that sacrifice? But we do have to ask ourselves, is you know a 20 euro Ryanair flight compatible with the uh, climate agenda or, you know, or is it madness? I think I've ticked all the big ones there, have I? Throw thanks. It back over to you, Paul. Uh, thanks, Connor. We might hand it off to Hannah. And good luck getting home from Austria on, on your bicycle. Yes, I am actually slightly compromised when it comes yeah. to flying, obviously, with the uh, Viennese girlfriend. But yeah, <laughs> we make do. <laughs> uh, Hannah, um, uh, personal changes we can all make. Thanks, Paul. You know, in the interest of of of, of getting a bit controversial here, I would say that I was asked uh, on a on a. Um, podcast that I did last week, what is sort of the biggest misconception that you think uh, kind of that is in the climate sphere that you'd like to address? And personally, I, I think that we focus a little uh, too much on, on, on personal actions. Um, we put the onus on, on individuals to change their behaviour when they're just living normal life. I'm not saying that, you know, everyone can can sort of eat loads of red meat every day, you know, drive a, a gas guzzling car and, and, you know, leave the windows open while the heat is on. Obviously, there are many energy efficiency savings and, you know, ways that we can switch our, 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 our heating. But what really matters uh, for me, I think if you as an individual want to make a real difference, th th there's two things that you can do. First of all, it's to be vocal and politically active in this. So you um, you talk to politicians about what you want to, to see changed. You advocate for policies which make an effect to everybody. So that's one thing. Another thing is that um, you in whatever job that you do, are you a teacher? Are you an engineer? Are you uh, an architect? Are you, uh, you know, a homemaker? What can you do in your life that affects, you know, all, that that aspect of of your job in the company you work for the 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 school uh, and so on and 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 when you're making a choice as a student um, on what career path to take I want to kind of want to give the dig for energy engineering here but think about what degree can give you the solutions um, the qualification that can give you uh, can make you equipped to give the solutions so I can I can I'd be happy to give suggestions to any students on the line. Um, in terms of what difference that you can make then in your own life on top of Connor's very good suggestions, what I would really suggest is that um, when you're at the point in your life when you're making key decisions, basically where you're going to live, what job you're going to do, it's at those points that really make a decision, make an impact on your lifetime, uh, on your lifetime emissions impact impact. So when you buy a house, are you going to buy a kind of a compact house uh, where you can walk your kids to, to school and where you can where you can maybe take public transport to work or cycle to work? Or are you going to you know buy a, something out in the middle of the countryside where you where walking cycling isn't possible possible and it takes a lot of energy to heat the house? So it's that that critical junction in your life when you when you make that decision where you live. Uh, like Connor, I have a, a partner. My husband is is from continental Europe as well, so we have to fly maybe twice a year to go visit the family when as soon as COVID has gone, we're there. You know, that's our top priority is seeing family, I'm afraid. Um, so so we can't make those sort of sacrifices. So I'm not suggesting that you maybe marry Irish, <laughs> but it's 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 really those sort of those those key decisions that you make that impact your, your life. Um, back to you, Paul. And who said scientists didn't have an emotional integrity? Here we are recommending that people should marry local people. Well done. Uh, well done, Hannah. Shane, coming to you and maybe Shane, can I ask you maybe to focus a little bit something that's kind of broad within your research, uh, your research as well. Just a question of agriculture. You know, this comes through in the questions time and time again. Why is it such a big challenge in Ireland? And maybe first of all, just set the context. What does agriculture represent in part in, when we look at all our greenhouse gas emissions? Um, so agriculture is actually Ireland's arguably biggest contributor to climate change. Um, and one thing that's unique about Ireland is the um, kind of ratio of um, energy and say uh, related emissions to agricultural emissions. So most countries uh, in Europe have a much smaller share uh, of their emissions coming from agriculture, whereas because we're predominantly reliant on beef farming, we have quite a big share. And the reason beef um, in particular is worth mentioning is because ruminants, um, so sheep, um, 
and cattle in particular, when they eat grass, they belch out a lot of methane, and methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. Depending on, on how you measure it, it's about 28 times more potent than CO2. And so if, if we continue to consume lots of dairy and red meat, what we do is we produce a demand for more um, animal-based products and, and these uh, lead to big emissions of methane. And one of the things is like, so arguably when we use fossil fuels, yes, this is worse for the planet, but we kind of have a road to net zero with carrots. So we know that we can go from petrol and diesel to electric vehicles. We know that we can go from home heating oil to heat pumps, but we don't have that same roadmap for agriculture. And so one of the best ways to deal with agriculture emissions rather than a technology swap is to just reduce our overall demand. Now, um, I had I had one more point, but I think Hannah and Connor both sold it. I said I have a local girlfriend, so that seems to be my best contribution to climate action. Um, and just again, one thing that I did was I was in college. I, I'm from Roscommon, went to college in Galway. And when I kind of became more aware of my impact on the planet, the first thing I did was I sold my car. And recently I bought myself an electric bicycle. And I do live on one of those hills in Cork that is nearly 90 degrees. But just the idea of, you know, bike to work scheme, a great little government incentive was able to, to get it for pretty cheap. And I've cut, like, one, one thing I'm, I'm a big fan of is um, two birds, one stone. So I was spending 25 euro a week on the bus. It was uber unreliable. It wasn't very comfortable. And now what I do is I have a bicycle that is paying for itself. I get to work on time because I know when I leave the house, I get there and no emissions. So it's, it's kind of tr try and look for things that, um, two birds, one stone solutions, as I said. Excellent, Shane. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, Hannah, tricky question for you. Hannah, look, you've worked with International Energy Agency. You've worked with governments around the world. A um, couple of questions coming through here on on the on different interpretations of the science. Do we need to be climate neutral by 2030? And could you put that in the context of if, if that interpretation was correct, what would that actually mean for uh, our, the country and what does it mean for our economy and our personal lives, Hannah? Yeah, thanks, Paul. That's that's a, a question that's at the top of many people's minds. Is you know, is is a climate neutral by or sorry, carbon neutral by twenty fifty? Is it is it um is it too late? Um, there has to so, so first of all, going back to the science of, of what I mentioned about the glo global uh, carbon budget, and to basically to have a, a, a better than fifty percent chance of limiting our global warming to 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius, we need the, the whole world needs to reduce its emissions uh, to net zero uh, by the second half of the 20th century. And that's entrenched in the Paris Agreement. So there's a, the Paris Agreement to Article 4, uh, which every country signed up to. Hopefully the uh, US will re-sign uh, up to that again in, back in January. Um, uh, it, basically that, that we that we reach this, this climate neutral goal in the second half of the 20th century. Now, how we allocate that by country is is the big question. Now Ireland is we're relatively well developed. We have a lot of uh, emissions per capita. Uh, we also do uh, ruminant agriculture very well. That's basically one of our uh, one of our kind of one of Ireland's specialities in terms of our industry is is agriculture emissions. So there's many questions about what's the fairest way to 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 allocate that global carbon budget or or, or basically uh, uh, um, uh, to different countries. Some people would argue that Ireland is well developed, so we should decarbonize the fastest. Um, and uh, it also depends on what, what are known as negative emission technologies being developed in the second half of the 20th century. So basically um, technologies that extract emissions from the air that can that can basically compensate for, for more fossil fuel reductions. So what I would say that it's it's a very tricky question, but it has to be a balance between what is realistic and what is uh, what is needed according to the science um what i what i my my own personal opinion is that ireland is signing up to the most ambitious decarbonisation target for 2030 of any country i'm aware of we are also putting the net zero for 2050 target into law which will put us among the handful of countries which have done so so i think in terms of setting targets for this ireland is already at the sort of at the forefront um, Ireland, however, has a very um, good history of setting targets and not meeting them. So what we really need to focus our attention on is not so much 
the target, but what are we actually going to do? What policies are we going to take and what actions do we need to take in the next year, in the next two years to move people away from fossil fuels? And how can it be done in a way that doesn't uh, disimprove people's lives? So many, many people suffer from having um, not enough heating in their homes. A lot of people can't afford a car and their lives would be vastly improved with a car as well. So we have to take into account, you know, you, you, you can't dread, uh, you can't immediately reduce, if you immediately stopped fossil fuel use, there would be huge suffering. We could have blackouts, our economy could crash. So you have to balance those needs, those basically environmental sustainable, environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, social sustainability. And that's really what causes the, the sort of the, 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 the negotiation and the, and the lag that, we, that we're seeing. Back to you, Paul. Uh, uh, thanks, Anna. Yeah, that's that's um, um, thanks, Anna. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I always pause for thought when you say that, you know, that no country in the world has ever deliberately done in peacetime what Ireland sets out to do over the next 10 years to reduce your emissions intentionally by a half. It's a, it's a real uh, remarkable level of uh, of ambition and let's hope we can get there. And Connor, one of the things that we often hear, um, you know, the incremental stuff won't be enough. You know, the, the, the current climate action plan talks about lots of EVs and lots of solar and walking and diets and all of this. But we might have to look at some pretty disruptive changes, Connor. And one of the things that comes up a lot in the questions is nuclear. Um, talk to me about nuclear energy in Ireland and whether it's an option or not. OK, yeah, good. I might, yeah, I'll start with talking about nuclear, but then I want to make another point as well. But uh, yeah, so nuclear uh, does come up a lot. Certainly uh, when we do debates with our first years in energy engineering, we ask them to come up with a model for Ireland 2050 and they all place their faith that we will either suck the carbon that we've emitted out of the air or we'll just build a nuclear plant and that will solve all our problems. Because when you do physics at the leaving cert level and you learn about the potential of nuclear, it's, it's crazy. I can't remember the exact, but it was something like if you had like this much uranium, you could power Ireland for a year, whereas if you know the amount of wind you would need to power Ireland for a year is insurmountable. It's huge. So the energy intensity of the fuel is remarkable, and yeah, it doesn't emit anything. And it's a long time since Chernobyl, although it's not so long since we had the disaster in Japan in Fukushima. But still, the technology has come a long way, and people, you know, have this uh, concept of a small nuclear or small modular reactor. So it could be mass produced, super safe. You know, you just kind of buy it like an IKEA furniture nuclear reactor that you pop into a country and it doesn't matter if they have the skills or capabilities to build it. But there is still questions, you know, about uh, the ability of that country, I suppose, to operate it. And also if this is even a realistic thing. And then that's just yeah, looking at the technology and perhaps challenges. There's also how people might perceive it. The environmental movement in Ireland was actually founded because there was a proposal for a nuclear reactor uh, not even in Ireland, across the water in, in the UK and they had a music festival and this whole anti-nuclear kind of movement emerged. And then, so, you know, you have countries like Germany, which are getting rid of their nuclear now because there's such this uh, public dislike for it. And in Austria, they had a referendum back in the 1980s after Chernobyl and they voted that they would never have nuclear. Although on the other side, of course, you do have countries that are adding it. But yeah, I think in people's mind, nuclear is too dangerous and people aren't going to want to live near it. It is great in terms of its energy intensity and from a technical point of view, but I think, yeah, I'd uh, sum up as Hannah did actually during the debate we did with our engineers last year when we asked them uh, yes or no, and then they could also say maybe yes or maybe no. I would probably be uh, maybe yes to nuclear, but not in Ireland, given, you know, our history with infrastructure projects like the, perhaps the children's hospital or any other contract that you want to think about and how it's uh, not particularly worked. And then the other point to add is, um, that we don't actually need nuclear in Ireland. So if we have an interconnector with France, we can use France's nuclear and we don't have to build it in Ireland. And maybe that is a better way to go. Back to you, Paul. Thanks very much, Connor. Thanks very much, Connor. Uh, excellent. We've got a question, uh, Shane, actually coming in from our friends in Clonmel. They have a good question on waste and how can you be more efficient with your waste as a family? Could you tell us a little bit about your research and some of the things you can do at home uh, to reduce your waste and some of the things you can do actually with your waste afterwards to produce energy? I can. So uh, first thing I'd like to mention, um, actually, so one of the biggest problems we have is food waste. So in the same way we try to change our diet, 30% of the food we produce actually goes straight into the bin. And so even if you never change your diet, I recommend you do, but the best thing you could probably do is try and eliminate that food waste. And that means, you know, um, maybe not buying way too much at one time, 
keeping an eye on your fridge and stuff. But there is always an, an inevitable amount of waste. And one thing that we try and do here um, is to try and pair up problems. So we have a problem with food waste and we have a problem where we need renewable energy. And what we do is we use a technology called anaerobic digestion, where the food is broken down by microbes similar to how a cow's stomach work and it produces gas but rather than like in the cow that gas being emitted to the atmosphere and causing greenhouse uh, causing climate change sorry um, we can capture it and turn it into a fuel so we have food waste we capture it turn it into a fuel and now we're treating waste which would have to have been done anyway and we're offsetting the use of natural gas so what what um other, other elements of waste that we try and try and do is like obviously we're trying to avoid landfill um, not necessarily because it's bad for the climate, but because that is just unsustainable in general. So number one, try and eliminate food waste at the source because it's good for your pocket, it's good for the planet. And number two, then try and use solutions that uh, don't just turn it into maybe compost, but also try and turn it into an energy source. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Shane. Thanks very much. Uh, maybe coming back to the, uh, some broader questions coming in now just on the Slido and get your questions in on Slido.io. Uh, there's a there's a hashtag there to go with that. Or I'll just punch me here in the side panel and we can get to them as well. In terms of Ireland's top priorities, Hannah, what do you see Ireland's top priorities for climate action over the next decade as we look at the Climate Action Bill? Oof, I suppose, you know, there's no silver bullet. Um, uh, basically, in the same way that kind of cost efficiency is a principle underlying every policy and every sort of decision and investment by the government has been to date. So, you know, everything needs to make sense in terms of cost. In future, every decision that we make needs to be sense checked against climate. So is it compatible? Is this uh, is is this piece of infrastructure? Is this policy? Um, uh, is everything consistent with our objective of, of having emissions in the next decade? So there has been huge focus on, um, on increasing our capacity for renewable electricity and that's in one way a very good thing it's creating a lot of jobs it is um it is doing a lot to um to to to, to, to increase the wind energy industry uh, ireland is a really world leader in, in wind energy and we're projected to have or our target is to have 70 percent of our electricity coming from renewables in 2030 but we really have to focus on that decarbonizing heat and decarbonizing transport because you know we've got lots of houses that run on oil um, is it going to be affordable to, to get those onto heat pumps uh, fueled by wind uh, and is the grid going to be stable enough to deliver that? That's a, that's a huge question. Um, what are we going to do about the people who can't afford an electric car or, you know, uh, uh, um, beyond 2030? How are we going to make these things affordable for people? So I think getting those policies in place to make um, low carbon heat and low carbon transport affordable for normal people is the, is the biggest priority. And Connor, um, uh, Connor, just coming to you, 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 your research, you work a lot with communities, you look, you work a lot with different groups on Ireland, down in Ningle. Can you talk to us about what priorities you think we need to focus at a community level, really to empower communities and get people involved in this transition? Yes, thanks, Paul. I'm allowed to make two points, even though you said a top one is I'm yeah, slightly compromised on it myself. I can't decide. One of the beauties of being a researcher, maybe, is you get to sit on the fence on things and see all our sides. But one of the things uh, is energy poverty, certainly is the 300,000 or 350,000 households that are currently in receipt of a fuel allowance this winter. And we're talking about, you know, people struggling to invest in retrofits and, and heat pumps. But I think as an absolute priority, we need to ensure that nobody in Ireland is experiencing fuel poverty. We had the point made earlier that Ireland's a very well developed, wealthy country. So we should be really ambitious on our climate targets. But if we're such a wealthy and well-developed country, then why do we have so many households that are experiencing fuel poverty still and then require sub subsidy? Uh, so that would be maybe, yeah, as a national level. And then, yeah, to tip back into my own research, I think one of the things that's great in the climate bill is this mandate for local authorities to produce a climate action plan. So each county will have to decide what they want to do and they'll have to review it every five years. And this is a great opportunity then to bring in some sort of dialogue or deliberation. So we bring together our planners and our representatives of the community, different business leaders maybe in each county and agree and have a discussion about what is the priority for our county in terms of energy development and what are our opinions on different technologies. And to have that discussion about what are the, you know, the limitations on different technologies, what do different technologies alter in terms of how we might, you know, do things 
and what are the priorities or the constraints maybe from a planning perspective and to really embed it within that you know the county development plans and the local area plans to make it happen I suppose to actually deliver it then but I think, yeah great opportunity there for some deliberation and to bring you know different people into the room and see what everyone thinks about what the best option is for the next five years. Thanks very much, uh, Connor. Shane, if I come to you, Shane, it's Science Week. You know, we're speaking here to a lot of different uh, students, uh, transition students, researchers, and different people around the country. Let me ask you kind of a soft question. I'll come around to the panel uh, uh, in, a, in a few moments. So, you know, when I was in, in school, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I think I wanted to be an astronaut or a priest, and I think I failed on both of those quite successfully. Shane, what got you into science, and are you happy that you've done it? And I'll come around and, and just Hannah and Connor, you can mull on that, but talk with uh, what are some of the benefits of, of doing a career in science and maybe some of the um, some of the uh, upselling components you can talk about. Maybe, maybe I'm misplaced on Science Week because I count myself as an engineer at all times, but um, I would have been one of those weird kids where I kind of always knew what I wanted to do and I ended up there. I ended up there on a, a little more of a wavy path than maybe I imagined at 12 years of age, but um, I've always had a big interest in machinery, in um, weirdly inefficiency, in how systems work. And so I naturally went towards the maths route. I studied physics, chemistry, construction for my leave insert, and I did mechanical engineering in college. And when I finished mechanical engineering, I decided to pair that with my passion for environmentalism. And I thought the best thing I can do is work on, as Hannah said, work on solutions to the problem. So the best way I felt I could contribute to um, the change I wanted to see in the world was to upskill and to learn about it and to try and take what I've learned and disseminate it to my friends, my family, the public. And so for me, being an engineer and scientist has been a, a great career choice because every day I come into work, I get to have conversations with people who know more than me and I learn a lot and it's, it's really enjoyable and um, it's cliche, but when, when you enjoy what you do, you don't really have to, to work a day in your life. And particularly um, doing my PhD, I got to come in in the morning and on a Monday I was working on papers. On a Tuesday, I go to a national school and teach them about science and engineering. And then on a Wednesday, I could be up in Dublin speaking to policymakers. And no other career except for science and engineering offers you this diversity and offers you the chance to indulge your curiosity. Um, so I, I would I would always encourage people to go into it. And one great thing that I'll leave is a degree in science and engineering leaves you so open to other choices in the future. It's a great base. You don't have to stay a scientist for the rest of your life, but people appreciate the skills that you gain as a scientist and an engineer and appreciate the way you think and you can apply that to business, you can apply it to teaching, whatever you want to do. So that's that's my plug. That's wonderful. That's, uh... That's wonderful, Shane. Yes, and we we all agree you haven't worked a day in your life. That's uh, that's uh, that's fantastic. Hannah, maybe coming to you and, and and maybe a little bit, you know, about your reflections of how you get into your career, and maybe you chat to us a little bit uh, about women in science. You know, we're, we're talking here to a lot of students. You know, um, what are your thoughts on 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 uh, women being being represented correctly and adequately right, right across the science and engineering? That's a great. Great, great, great question, Paul. Thank you very much for highlighting that. I suppose first I'll give you a bit of a background in my own sort of meandering career path. And I, th I found that lots of people who work in the area of sort of energy and climate, there's no sort of direct career path to this. There are some more direct than others. I, I had a, a somewhat indirect path. I actually studied uh, maths at an undergraduate level. It's very just interested in maths. I like the maths like it was chess, not necessarily like an engineer applying it to any practical solutions. I just just loved, you know, the problem solving and and the and the pure theory, almost the philosophy of maths. I got this great opportunity then when um, after my third year as an undergraduate in UCC to study abroad in California. And I, I took an extra year in my degree, uh, you know, in Ireland, we kind of only study our degree in our, in our undergraduate years. But in America, they take wide classes. So I took classes in like English literature, um, you know, Spanish, but I also took classes in sustainable development, in uh, in some natural resource economics and and uh, and this brilliant class called Blood and Oil, which gave this huge, remarkable ge um, kind of geopolitical history of uh, fossil fuel uh, and uh, fossil fuels and the implications for climate change. And this just blew my mind. You know, it was just such a powerful class reading lots of books about history and the impact of fossil fuels on climate change. And, you know, I was thinking about it. I was like, you know what? It's 
this is all just maths really, isn't it? You know, it's it's what is low carbon, you know, how much energy we use, I was, you know, I, the, the idea of, of, of kind of an energy model before uh, uh, before I even knew what an energy model was ca came to my mind from this. I started exploring then when I came back to UCC about who was doing this sort of thing, which is putting maths some, some some something in the intersection between policy, making a difference in policy, maths and energy, climate stuff, and uh, and I and I was very lucky to come across Brian O'Gallagher, who is the the um the co-chair of 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 Marai, um and he's a professor of energy engineering in UCC, and I was very lucky to have him accept me as a as a PhD student, a master's at the start. So I came in. Honestly, I didn't know anything about energy. <laughs> I don't think he knew that at the time, but I suppose he took uh, the thing. The nice thing about a STEM um, degree and maths degree is how applicable it is. And I will say something about my maths degree is that um, oh, my classmates are in massively diverse areas doing like health analysis, uh, working for hospital systems, pan even pandemic um, uh, modeling. Um, you know, computers, physics, all sorts of things. So, so that kind of general degree and skills that a STEM um, degree gives you is can get you into lots of different positions. So, I did my PhD, um, kind of building these these mathematical models of the energy system on which to simulate different um, policies. Um, I, I very much tried to broaden my 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 expertise then into more economics and social science because I think those those sort of skills are are vital to have interdisciplinary skills. So I think people who are very interested in these kinds of things, not just at the technical level, but if they can take take broader sort of um, kind of view of, of, of political economy, economics, sociology, things like that, it can really broaden your horizons to not just kind of address um, a problem with one tool like like climate change. It needs many, many tools to, to go into it. So um, um, I think kind of Paul after my PhD then I worked as a postdoc in UCL in London which was fantastic uh, I worked as an analyst at the International Energy Agency I represented the IEA at, uh, at UN events and things like that so it's before coming back to UCC as a lecturer so it's been a, a hugely exciting and interesting career um, I absolutely love it uh, I, I think I have the best job in the world <laughs> um, and then going going into the the the, the sort of the topic of, of women in 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 STEM um, I, I'm 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 really heartened to see you know so many bright young women who want to make a difference, and that's the sort of I don't want to be uh, sort of stereotypical, but in any room that I'm in where there is a meeting about making a positive difference to the world, there's a much bigger there's a there's a gender balance much more towards women. So women you know, want to make a difference. Want like often I mean obviously men do too. I don't want to as I said make generalizations. But when there are topics like, you know, providing energy access to the world, dealing with climate change, energy poverty, air pollution, um, you know, I, th I think those real world grounded issues about how you can use technical skills to solve those problems are, are very a very strong motivating force. I will say that um, I had a very empowering um, female boss at the IEA who was a big inspiration to me and I think it is important also to see women at the head. I don't think we're, not, we're there yet in terms of seeing enough women leaders are having their voices amplified um but but i think there's a much kind of stronger growing consent uh, growing awareness of that um to, to, to see women leaders you see many of the youth strikers greta thunberg and irish climate strikers they're 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 they're, they're uh, largely many of them are young women so i think that's it's incredibly positive for the future Thanks, Anna. Fantastic. Yeah, that's wonderful. Great point, isn't it? You know, and we need more scientists, engineers and advocates and politicians and people with, with greater scientific literacy, you know, and that's a um, it's really important, you know, and, and for me, I think not only is science a really helpful way of thinking about the world, but it's a form of advocacy as well, isn't it? You know, you can you can protest and that's really important, but you can publish, uh, you can inform as Shane said, you can sit down face to face with the policymakers. Uh, that's pretty impactful. And that's uh, that's one of the really cool things that, that we really like about our job. Maybe Con Connor, coming to you, uh, uh, how do you stumble into science? And, and Connor, are you happy with your job? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I'm very happy with my job. I did actually, you know, we were talking earlier about what we can do personally, and I kind of listed out the little things I do personally, and then I thought afterwards, oops, I forgot to mention, but actually, I think my biggest contribution probably to climate change is that I get to be a PhD researcher in energy engineering. So hopefully that is making some sort of contribution, and that is probably the thing that I'm most happy about, you know, my full time job, although being a PhD, it does tend to stretch outside of the nine to five hours. 
is working on solutions to climate change and trying to make something happen. So that is yeah, very comforting for me whenever I sometimes sit down and think, you know, God, this is too much. This is overwhelming. What the hell are we going to do? But I can be self, you know, assured that at least I'm in the winning team, as it were. Well, hopefully the winning team anyway. Uh, what was it? You're either part of the solution or part of the problem. So yes, yeah, certainly part of the uh, solution. But yeah, just to, to state that, that that's yeah, I'm very happy. And that is yeah, one of the great things, I suppose, about getting into to research. I mean, when I was finishing college, maybe I'm going to do this backwards now because I'll talk about finishing college and then I'll go back to how I got there. But when I finished college, I didn't want to get a job in industry because I was looking at these companies and I thought they're not doing enough. You know, there's no one out there that I can see that is making a big enough difference. There's a company that I could get behind and say that I'd be happy to work for them. So I proposed a research topic to Brian and Ed. It was kind of serendipity. I met Ed Byrne, my other supervisor, for a coffee uh, to talk because I was wrongly introduced to him as the chairperson of the engineering society at the time. So we were to meet to talk about organizing an event, but then we just yeah, carried on anyway. And we talked about this idea that we need a better dialogue around what we do with our energy transition and involving people instead of having these protests like we have the Northside Interconnector. And then, yeah, I was successful. Eventually, Brian secured the funding and I've yeah, it really loved it since then as a PhD student to maybe you're not particularly well paid, but the great thing that I love is the freedom and the fact that you're your own project manager. So it's my project that I got to kind of work out and propose and then it's, you know, my decisions. Whenever I go to my supervisor and say, I'm thinking about doing this, do you think it's a good idea? They'll say, well, you know, it's your, it's your, your choice. Here's our opinions, but you make the final say, which I really like and the freedom to work when you want. So you can kind of, you know, decide on your holidays yourself as so I sometimes make the joke with my girlfriend like oh I need to check with my boss if it's okay if we go to the shop before lunch and then I just you know do a little monologue with myself or I pretend to ask myself if I should take an hour break but yeah that's why I love it uh, how I got here is a little bit yeah more muddled I'm the son of a chemical engineer and a social worker and when I was graduating uh, secondary school I was kind of confused about which one I was going to follow uh, I knew I was an engineer because I'd always been really good at maths and physics but I did a work placement in my dad's factory, Boston Scientific in Clonmel, just the, the summer before. I was quite fortunate to get an eight week experience of what an engineer does. And I found it soul crushing. I mean, the, I was working with these people that had spent 30 years trying to shave seconds off a production line or move tables around so they're slightly more ergonomic. And it, I mean, it was OK for eight weeks and it was really well paid. But the idea that I would, you know, spend my whole life in some factory like this with this multi international that didn't care about me kind of turned me off chemical engineering completely. And at the time I was yeah doing a bit of soul searching maybe. So I thought I wanted to be a psychologist, work with people. It's this infinitely complex machine. If the mind breaks, it's you know, it's not like oh, get the manual out. Let's figure out what's wrong with it. There's so many different things that can go wrong in there. Uh, but then yeah, so I, I did a year of chemical engineering when I first entered college, failed it pretty much on purpose because I didn't have the guts to tell my parents I hated it. Then I did a year of psychology and I also failed that because it turned out it involved a lot of reading, which I didn't really like doing at the time and writing essays. Uh, I preferred solving problems. So then I went back, I found energy engineering and it's yeah, been a success story ever since then, thankfully. But yeah, don't be deterred. I also repeated my leaving cert uh, before, so I had more time. I did four years in two or two years in four. So yeah, if you're a, a young student and you're worried that it's all decided too much in the leaving cert, yeah, it'll work out eventually. Thanks, Connor. Well, we really need to start reading our CVs a little bit more carefully before people submit to UCC. This is the main thing I'm, I'm hearing here. Um, we've only got five minutes left, folks. I'm going to go to uh, Shane, Hannah and Connor uh, with one question. But Shane, just briefly, if you can answer this in parallel, just uh, Jessica has come in there. With why, why are we focusing so much on e-cars? And as a finishing question, I want you to Tell me about if you if, if Minister Eamon Ryan was here in front of us, what would be the one thing you would say to him or one thing you would ask him to do um, just briefly? So to you first, Shane, first on EVs and then to uh, Minister Eamon Ryan. Yeah, so pretty simply, um, number one, I think reducing transport demand is more important um, than anything else. And that includes, you know, switching to walking and cycling. But Ireland's focus on EVs has really been um, a function of our success in wind energy. So the better we get at wind and the better we get at solar, eventually we reach a point where we have lots of this surplus. So where the wind is blowing and we don't necessarily have the demand for it. And the ideal situation with electric vehicles is we can use their batteries as a way of storing it. And so we, what, what, what it's called is coupling um, sectors. So if we pair electricity generation and transport together, 
um, we get a kind of a, a synchronous solution, you know. And so we're not necessarily wholly focused on EVs just because transport is bad, but it also helps us to um, continue our success with electricity generation. Um, and what would I say to Minister Eamon Ryan? Um, I'm, uh, no expletives. Uh, I, I think our energy policy needs to focus more on, on so, uh, social solutions. So some of the stuff that's been mentioned this evening is is energy poverty, and I think that's that's huge. If 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 we start to pair engineering and climate solutions with social problems, all of this resistance to change begins to fall away. And exactly what Connor talked about: if we try and tell someone who is spending 20% of their wages on coal and the house is still never warm, that they're bad and what they're doing is bad for the planet, we're never going to win them on board. Whereas if we can offer them solutions like, you know, insulating their home, switching them to heat pumps and doing it uh, in a way that means their actual we weekly fuel bill is less, then climate change doesn't even enter enter the frame. You know, they're, they're going to want to invest in these solutions because it'll make their home uh, more comfortable, it'll save them money, and then the whole idea of trying to convince people that climate change is a big problem that we need to solve kind of disappears. So to Eamon Ryan, I would say focus on the social aspect of the climate transition before we get into the nitty gritty and blaming people for where the emissions come from. Thanks, Paul. Thank, thanks, Shane. Thanks, Shane. Excellent. No blame, folks, on people. Connor, you have one minute. Uh, what would you say to Minister Eamon Ryan? Uh, yeah, maybe just to build on Shane's point, I think one of the reasons that we see this push for electric vehicles over past the public transport or other ways of doing it is because we have this focus on an economic model which is all revolved around consumerism and buy, 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 and that's what keeps the country healthy. You know, we have to keep buying and growing. But if we look at, you know, maybe this isn't a great model, this is perhaps the cause of climate change, which is a lot to get into in the one minute slot I have left. But the basic idea is that we need a redistribution. So something like public transport is accessible to all. It helps people that can't drive. Maybe they're too old. It helps disabled people. You know, so it's it's a fantastic service and it provides account, a connectivity and accessibility, whereas a car only benefits the individual. So what we maybe need, and it goes back to Hannah's point as well. I'd heard it made a few times. Maybe if we had more women designing this policy, we would think more about the we and the family than we would about the me and the individual and the kind of the personal gain and what I need to gather. We would think more about what we as a whole need to achieve. And it's yet yeah, maintaining that social level, that bottom barrier that people are warm, comfortable, healthy and, you know, have access to education in that. But then also that that doesn't come at the cost of creating, you know, a climate breakdown as we're doing at the moment. And maybe uh... And maybe just the last point, Hannah, very briefly in a couple of seconds, what would you say to Minister Ryan? I would say please increase funding for research and analysis so we can take on lots more bright young PhDs who want to make a, a difference to the world and create uh, the capacity to do as much evidence based policy making as possible in the country so that we can support the best policies that will that will make the most difference to climate while serving people's lives. That's one that's that's wonderful, Hannah. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panel. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Thank you all the teachers and students and everyone who got involved. Um, uh, that's been a real lot of fun. It's Science Week. Um, uh, Climate Action, Greta, Greta Thunberg said, listen to the scientists. Why don't you be a scientist? Uh, thank you all for listening and I hope you all have a wonderful week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.